Well, it's great to be here with all of the cat lovers in the conference. And I'm really excited to share with you some new information that was just released in January that should have a big impact on some of your uh, cat operations and your interactions with veterinarians and um, how you decide how to allocate your resources to have the best outcome for the most cats possible. So I am uh, Julie Levy. I'm professor of shelter medicine at the University of Florida in our shelter medicine program. I'm also co-founder of the Million Cat Challenge with Kate Hurley at UC Davis. Um, how many of you are in a sh have a shelter? You work with work or volunteer with a shelter, and how many of your shelters are enrolled in the Million Cat Challenge? Yay, almost as many. If there are any of you that don't know about the Million Cat Challenge or just haven't joined yet, um, go ahead and check us out at milliongatchallenge.org. It's a shelter-based campaign across North America. It was originally designed to save a million more cats over five years. And 1,500 shelters signed up, and they saved a million more cats in four years. So uh, Maddie's Fund refunded us and extended the project, and the shelters have already surpassed two million more lives saved compared to their baseline in six years. So it's been an amazing program. Uh, it's uh, very practical. There's something that every single shelter can find to boost their feline life saving. And um, if you are in the Million Cat Challenge and you haven't turned in your data for 2019 yet, you are overdue and you've probably been getting a lot of emails from us. So go ahead and answer some of those so we can uh, get last year's data. But today we're gonna be talking about new guidelines from the, Associ uh, the American Association of Feline Practitioners. These are the veterinarians that have special interest in cat medicine and they have the cat specialty. And every 10 years or so they update guidelines. And I was so fortunate to be able to sit on an international committee of experts on these viruses. And we developed a very long intensive document, 26 pages of fine print on everything from diagnosis to treatment to adoption. And any question that you have about these viruses will be in there. But today I wanted to sort of digest it all down to the most important changes that are different than our last version of the guidelines. You can go on to the website catvet.com and download your own free copy. I also submitted it to the conference organizers. So if, if there's a section of uh, the app that has references, um, you can download it from there. Um, and so this is, what I am going to do is skip to just the changes. I'm not gonna give a kind of foundational introductory talk on these viruses, because I think this audience already knows you've been you know, dealing with this and that what you really wanna hear is what's different. So there might be some questions that you have if um, I sort of skipped something that, that you missed along the way. And so hold those to the end. I'm gonna try to get through these five big takeaways and save time at the end to fill in any blanks or expand on anything that you think is important. So as this will be truly the lightning round, we're gonna go fast and hit the highlights. So these are my five key takeaways that, from those 26 pages of fine print and over 100 references that were cited is uh, some new information on routine testing protocols, uh, really exciting new information on staging FELV, and that is work that we've done with a three-year study with the cat program at Austin Pets Alive, very intensively testing cats, and that has given us some brand new tools that you didn't have in the past. Um, I think a lot of you probably already are aware that we've been pretty comfortable letting FIV positive cats mingle with uninfected cats, but I'll talk more about that. And a paradigm shift for mass testing, and this is um, a big shift that you're probably familiar with of many shelters are starting to reduce the amount of testing that they're doing and instead asking the new veterinarian to take on that role um, rather than having shelters test every single cat. That's causing you know, a lot of, of turmoil and discussion within our profession. And I'm gonna make a pitch that adoption of these cats is better than long-term institutionalization. So when I am, um, there's new data to show that cats that are in homes with low density of stress in other cats do better long term than cats that are that go to sanctuaries that are designed just for these cats. So first I am going to give you just a little bit of a background so we're all on the same page. 
comparing FELV and FIV. They're both retroviruses, the same family of viruses, but they're quite different in uh, how the cat's immune system reacts to them and the kinds of diseases that they cause. So FELV we know is spread by just close intimate contact in body fluids. Most cats become infected with FELV from their mother. So there's an infected mother cat, she has kittens, and she passes virus in the milk or in the saliva by grooming. So we talk about it um, as FELV being a virus that you give to your friends. In contrast, FIV is spread primarily by fighting. So it's pre present in the saliva, cats bite, they inject that virus. And so we say that FIV is a virus that you give to your enemies. Kind of easy way to remember the difference with that. And we see a difference then in, in the kinds of cats that are infected. So more young cats we will see are infected with FELV because most of them were infected from their mothers. Um, and then with FIV, we see it almost always in the big mature male cats that are fighting. Um, the nice thing about FIV though is in cats that don't fight, it's very uncommon for them to spread it. So we have started allowing FIV positive cats to be co-housed with uninfected cats. And that, that's a, a change for us. We used to really hit on segregation and we're loosening up where that is not the case with FVLV. We still really want those cats segregated from uninfected cats. Um, the nuance of FVLV that's going to be important to understand because now we can identify these subsets with, with advanced testing is cats that generally fall into a progressive stage or a regressive stage. And the, when cats become infected with FELV, generally the most common outcome is they have high levels of virus, they are likely to develop disease and early death more commonly, and they are more infectious to other cats. Or if they have a good immune response to that virus, they will suppress it to very low levels, they will not shed it very much to other cats, and they may live a normal lifespan. And in the past, we just sort of talked about these in theory, but you didn't have any way to know the difference. And the good news is now there's a test out that can tell the difference. So this just is a, a pointing out that this is really the new information that you'll want to dig into and also make sure that your managers and the veterinarians you're working with too understand that there's this new, um, new approach. This is a life cycle that shows the transmission of FIV. So you have these positive cats, they fight, they inject it into another cat, they become infected, but many of those cats will live their entire life without having any clinical disease. So we see lots of old FIV positive cats that die of something else, and they don't develop a condition associated with their virus. But we do know there is a subset that do, and the most common clinical sign that we see is stomatitis or oral disease in those cats, but there's some other things that they can get to. Uh, but early death is not something that we expect to see with this virus. So it is called sometimes feline AIDS because the virus is in the same family as HIV, but we don't see the same kind of disease developing in cats that we would see in people with HIV. The, the cycle in FELV is really quite different. So cats become infected with FELV, and then depending on their immune response, go to the path of having uncontrolled virus, that top level. So high levels of virus, those cats are more likely to get sick and have short lifespans, or they can suppress the virus, in which case they can remain quite healthy and they don't shed very much. But what has been not appreciated very much until recently, until this study that we did with Austin Pets Alive, is cats over their lifetime can shift. So you can have a cat that is very happily living with a regressive infection and something happens to its immunity, stress perhaps, living with a lot of other cats, becomes pregnant or has another condition and its immunity wanes and that can allow that virus to come back up and put them into that progressive category where we see more disease. So we need to retrain how we've thought about this. We've, we're really tempted to try and put cats into buckets of positive or negative and think that that one test that we run at intake is gonna be meaningful for that cat for the rest of its life. And unfortunately, we're learning that with FELV, we just can't do that. It's possible that we could test a cat at intake and it has a regressive infection and that virus is suppressed so low that we get a negative result 
but that cat's infected and we just won't know. And then later in life, something might happen, it would come back up. And I'm sure you all, guys all have stories of that, of a cat that you tested negative and it had no exposure risk and yet later it's positive. And there's a few different reasons, but this is one explanation. So we need to think of cats as being for their whole life. If they're infected with FELV, they're on this balancing act and they can move back and forth depending on what's happening in their life. It wasn't quite the answer that we wanted. We did this big study funded by Maddie's Fund where we had 130 shelter cats from Awesome Pets Alive and we tested those cats with a panel of tests every month for six months. And our goal was, okay, we're gonna put all the uncertainty to rest, we're gonna determine what the best test is and then we will tell you all how to test cats for FELV. And what we found was, it was just so much more complicated than we understood. So here's what I'm going to recommend. I know that we all want certainty with our tests. We wanna know what's the best test so we can say with certainty to an adopter, this cat is infected or it's not infected. And I can just take that burden off of you now that you don't have to strive to achieve that because it's not possible. And in some ways, once I accepted that, um, I was, it's kind of a relief, because now I can just do the best I can. I can have a good protocol and accept that I'm gonna be wrong a certain percentage of the time. So this is what I'm now recommending for testing. For most cases in shelters, I would suggest what I call a one and done screening protocol. So if, if you have a protocol that is testing cats, use a good test, use whole blood, this is a key, whole blood is the best sample and that is not what we used to think. And um, personally, I th the IDEX snap test is the best test and we've compared them head to head and it is the best. If it's a, it can be a little bit more expensive. So if you need a cheaper test, I would use the witness test as my second choice and I would not use um, other tests that are like abaxis tests, which commonly used in shelters, really is very unreliable. So I would rather just not test than use that test. Um, so if, if you get a positive for either virus, I would just consider that cat infected. And in the old days, we, that was a really high risk um, label because we would euthanize those cats simply for being positive. And now we're saying we don't euthanize them anymore. We, we develop adoption programs FIV adoption programs became very common a number of years ago, and now the FELV adoption programs are taking off, largely because of the example that's been set here by the Austin Pets Alive um, shelter program, where they adopt out 500 or more FELV positive cats a year. Um, and if they're negative, again, for the most common situation, I would just consider those cats negative. And I think you can really stop here and just accept that some of your positives will be false positives, a few. Some of your negatives will be false negatives. But your attempt to go down repeated testing to guarantee yourself that that test is right or wrong is uh, a rabbit hole often of just delays and repeat testing and, and more confusion. I have a little caveat here. Um, if you have cat uh, blood donors, so if, if there's like veterinarians here who have a clinic cat or if you have your cat that is the, the usual blood donor, you really need to do PCR testing for them because that is a, using blood from a regressively infected cat's a really high risk procedure for spreading it. So the PCR test is more likely to detect those regressive cats. However, if you choose to go down the path of confirmation or more certainty or your original test is, um, doesn't really make sense in the pattern of what you know about the cat, or maybe it comes from a really high risk situation like a hoarding situation that has positive cats in there, you can go to the second level of testing, in which case that's a PCR panel. And that's definitely one that you wanna to send to IDEX PCR lab. It, it was really a very strong lab. They were partners with us in this research. And so we've, we understand the nuance of how these tests perform. Now, if your PCR test is positive, in a positive cat, that confirms your diagnosis and you can be very confident because you've tested the cat two different methods. They're both positive, like the odds of both of them being wrong are, are quite remote. Um, similarly, if the cat was negative on both tests, you can be very confident the cat's uninfected. Not 100%, we can never get there, but very confident. However, if your screening test is positive and your PCR test is negative, you have to 
just say that's discordant and we don't know which one is right. I think in the past we have confused veterinarians and others because we call this a confirmatory test that people always think that second test is the better one and that's the result you should trust. That's not the case. It only confirms the same status. So if they're discordant, you're left with this bucket of cats that um, you just have to say they're sort of suspicious, but we can't say for sure. And just manage them that. And now that we adopt them all out, it's so much less pressure to try and prove these one way or the other. So some of the pitfalls that I see repeated in shelters that you should avoid are one, select the good test, snap test or the witness test. Please use the test the way it was intended. So the kind of the ways I see the tests used in ways they were not intended is um, like maybe pooling multiple samples into one test device to save money. Like if there's a weak positive, you, you can take the chance of just diluting that one weak positive in the group and know that um, like kittens may be mixed litters. So you can't just test one kitten in the litter and assume that that's the same. And it's also, you can't test the mother and assume her kittens will be the, the same as her. We have positive kittens that are born to negative mothers because the mom is regressive at the time you test her, but the kittens got infected. So just when you, make, when you use a test is run a, a quality test. One test, one cat, record it all appropriately in the medical record. All right, now I'm gonna to go to the most exciting part. This is three years, a quarter million dollars worth of research, a lot of mills of blood um, that were collected by the team here from cats that didn't always, um, weren't thrilled about coming back every month. This is something like uh, over 100,000 test results that we had because we did whole blood, serum, plasma, seven different tests every month on every cat. And what this led to is a real breakthrough in understanding of FELV. And I did, um, I, I'm very happy to send these slides out to anyone who wants them or I can give them to the conference organizers and they can distribute them. So don't worry about like memorizing the minutia here. So, but what we found is there are two tests that really rose up to the top as being predictive and co as consistent as possible. One is that point of care screening test. It's an FELV antigen test <coughs> paired with a PCR test. But the PCR test was not the original one, it, which gives you a pos positive or a negative. It is a quantitative test. It tells you how much virus is in that blood. And that level turned out to be very predictive about whether those cats were regressively infected or progressively infected. And you can now stage cats yourself with this brand new test panel that IDEX built based on the results of our study. So the way this would work is you would run, say, a SNAP test, and if the FELV was positive, you would then send that whole blood off to the IDEX lab, and they would run an, a plate test for P27 antigen and they would run the quantitative PCR. Now there is a, a category that is called abortive, which means the cats, they have all negative tests, so we assume that they either have eliminated the virus, um, well, eliminated the virus. The only thing I would caution you about really diagnosing cats as abortive is remember the only component of the cat that we're testing is the blood. So if they have some virus in the spleen or the bone marrow or the GI mucosa, we're not gonna be able to see that. So it's different than in the research lab where they you know, necropsy the cats and test every tissue. All we're testing in live cats is the blood. So that's why we're a little bit conservative about saying a cat completely fought off the virus and it's negative now. But if that was the case, you would see that green cat, they're antigen negative, PCR negative, and we'd expect them to live a normal lifespan. Then if we go down to the progressive in the red, we see an antigen positive test they have a high level of PCR positive, a lot of virus. And these cats, we can predict, have a reduced lifespan and they're more likely to shed virus to other cats. So they're most likely to be kind of those classic FELV positive cats. Now, this is on average though, and we see cats that defy the rules, cats that we call progressive and they're alive eight years later. So we, you know, we're doing broad categories here. But the most interesting thing now is the regressive cats that we can discriminate because of this new PCR test. So we can see two different patterns. They can be negative on the antigen test and have a low positive on PCR or vice versa, a low positive 
on PCR and uh, positive on, or a negative on the antigen test. And those cats, they may develop some clinical disease or they may just live a normal lifespan. A challenge of really being able to tell you that today is the only cats that have been followed over their lifetime are experimentally infected research cats in Europe. So what we know about the lifespan of cats is based on a kind of an unnatural situation, like a dozen cats. But we're following these cats out now, the 130 cats that we've had in our study, for their lifetime, and we're three years into it now. And so this is really exciting news. It is brand new for you. So we've just got this. Um, information, and I'm sharing it with you. It's not published yet, but what we see in this graph is called a survival curve. So we start out at 100% of the cats being alive. This is over three years time, and it, the curves are how many cats are still alive. So those cats that fell into that abortive category for us, there were only 10 of them, but they were all still alive after three years. The cats that were infected but fell into that regressive category 80% of them are still alive after three years. But those cats, 85 cats that we determined were progressive, um, less than half of the cats made it to three years. So you can see now that you've got prognostic information in your hands, that you can just submit a sample to a diagnostic lab and make some predictions about the outcome of that cat, which you could never do before. So I am also going to just show you the reason why we are a little reluctant to say anything with certainty, because we get these patterns. So these are some of the cats um, from our study. And you can see that uh, each row is a month. And we tested these cats for um, six months every month. And then we came back like every six months kind of randomly and tested them again with all of these different tests. And this particular cat is um, positive sometimes on, um, for antigen. Um, always more, more likely to be positive on whole blood than serum because it's more accurate. And um, this cat was always positive on PCR, but a low amount of PCR. So we call this cat regressive, and he, he stays regressive the whole time. So he kind of follows the rules. Similarly, this cat is a progressively infected cat, and it's always positive across the board. So this cat follows the rules for being progressively infected, except that his survival is pretty good. We, we've, he's still alive and um, two years out, so we're seeing good survival. But So this cat is not a challenge to us. But here's another example of a cat that, you know, they just don't follow the rule. This cat actually kind of changes its status between regressive, progressive, abortive, regressive, and then at the last time point at three years was discordant, it didn't even match up. So this is what, you know, these kinds of results are what give me, like, let myself have a break to say, I, I can't be certain on these cats. And so you can let up also chasing answers that really can't be had at this time, if that makes sense. Okay, so our third point was going to be that to, to remind everybody, or if you hadn't heard this yet, that we are really pretty confident, and it's in the guidelines now, that FIV-positive cats, if they're otherwise healthy and they don't fight, can be group housed with uninfected cats. And you guys mostly know that, I think, but a lot of private veterinarians may not, and so you'll need to be part of the education of veterinarians that are working with you in practice, because this might be new. But the good thing is it's published in that AAFP document, so they can go to the scientific literature and, and uh, be comfortable that this is what the international standard is now. So what this means is if you group house cats, well, some shelters have just given up testing for FIV altogether, and they group house cats um, because now they, they know that that's okay. Or you might you know, free up your adoption rules to say, I will adopt cats into, you know, uninfected cats into a, a house that has an FIV positive cat, or vice versa, adopt your FIV positive cats into negative households, so that's okay. A really good study actually from a few years ago by Dr. Annette Litster that showed this. She followed cats over five years that were in a, a cat sanctuary and they had positive and negative cats that were mixed together and there was no transmission over that five years. That was really a landmark paper. However, what she also found was that cats that were in the sanctuary did not live as long and they developed more lymphoma and they developed more uh, stomatitis and other diseases 
than FIV positive cats that were adopted into a home alone or with one other cat. So this is where we start to develop that, you know, kind of intuitive, it makes sense, that cats that are in a home environment are generally going to have less stress, less comorbidities than cats that are housed in unusual numbers together in uh, um, often restricted environments. And the same, there's a, a new paper that was just published about FELV as well with the same thing. The outcomes of cats long-term were better in a home environment than in a sanctuary environment. So this is a, the most controversial topic is a paradigm for, uh, that is shifting mass screening of cats. So we have a lot of shelters for a very long time our, st our standard that we thought was most responsible was to just test all cats at intake. And that, that um, is what everybody expected. Adopters wanted to know the status of their cats, referring veterinarians uh, that they were going to would expect cats to be negative. But what was happening is, you know, about 2% or 3% of cats are positive. Tens of thousands of dollars were being spent on testing to identify very few cats. So shelters started to wonder if maybe they could redirect those funds to more productive use. And the way that started was with TNR programs. That was the first place where we said, you know, it's so much better to take those resources of screening cats for FELV and FIV um, away from that and put all that money into neutering more cats. And that the impact of neutering more cats had a huge impact on cat welfare because there weren't kittens that were born into the environment, most of whom would die a pretty miserable death before reaching adulthood. And uh, we also had the problem of, you know, at my own program, we used to euthanize all the positives even though they were healthy. And I, that I have to live with that on my conscience, it was the wrong thing to do. And so once we gave up screening cats for TNR, then we started looking farther for where else are we maybe testing unnecessarily. So this, this is causing heartburn for um, between shelters and local veterinarians, and it is something we're working on to bring people together and understand what it is we're recommending. So the guidelines um, address this, and the guidelines also say that every cat should be tested for these retroviruses. However, what the guidelines do not say is at the shelter. So we are suggesting that there be a shift from testing every cat at the shelter to testing cats where they're gonna receive their lifetime care. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So in shelters, if cats are individually housed, there is no imperative to test them for retroviruses while they're in the shelter. Now, if you have a group housing situation, you need to test cats at least for FELV because they can spread it with casual contact in group housing. So what a lot of shelters are doing now, instead of testing every single cat, they're just testing the high-risk cats. So cats that are sick, cats that have a history of exposure to infected cats. But they're not testing, um, or they're testing cats in group housing because that's a high-risk procedure or before they do something really expensive and invasive. So maybe if they're gonna do like big orthopedic repair, they might test the cat um, ahead of time before that. And then sometimes in legal cases, so cat hoarding, cat cruelty, it's part of a very thorough evaluation of those animals. But otherwise they are maybe not testing the routine individually housed cat that's healthy and instead being really clear in the adoption paperwork that your cat's not been tested, so you should not let it mingle with your other cats at home. You should make an appointment right away with your veterinarian to get it tested. A challenge is, of course, you know, how compliant are any of your adopters with anything you tell them to do at the time of adoption? Like, they're just excited. They don't hear anything you're saying. They're just imagining going to the pet store next and getting some toys. So we have to, I think, work on improving that communication and we definitely need to improve communication between shelters and veterinarians because we don't have a really smooth handoff of care generally. Um, just even the adoption paperwork we give, veterinarians complain all the time that you know, they get this sort of irrelevant stack of big thick amount of information that it's hard for them to just abstract out what they need to know, what's due next for them. So I think we, we need to do a better job on that. And we do have some examples. Awesome Pets Alive on their website has some really good toolkit for their FELV adoption program. And so you can see the handouts that they have for both uh, cat owners and for veterinarians. But this is one that the Edmonton Humane Society in Canada 
rolled out when they were explaining to their local veterinarians that they were going to stop routine testing of cats. And their choice, they wrote this letter and they, they went and met with local veterinarians. They explained they're still testing high-risk cats, sick cats, and group house cats, but not single house cats and kittens. And it went really well for them. They did not have a lot of, of pushback. I think where it goes really badly is if you catch local veterinarians off guard. Like they do not want to learn about this from a client that is bringing them their new pet, especially if it turns out that cat, kitten is infected and now they don't know what to say. So the concern about why, um, you know, what, how do you handle that potentially upset adopter if they are one of the 2% of cats you adopt out that is infected? This is where your communication with the uh, new adopter needs to be really good up front and then to have a lot of support for them on the back end if, you know, the new cat they thought was going to be a buddy for their current cat um, turns out to be F, uh, FELV infected, how you're going to handle that. This is our summary. This is straight out of that guideline document. So if you download that document off the Cat Vet website, you'll see this. Uh, but it does give a, a really solid support for recommendations regarding testing regard, and regarding vaccination. So if, you, if your uh, shelter managers and your local veterinarians really want some clear directive and that's backed up with science, it's, it's right here. And so finally, adoption is better. This is the, uh, where we're really landed on right now with this new data around survival and outcomes and health and all of the new FELV programs that are, are spreading around the country and taking off. You know, Awesome Pets Alive was a real innovator in this and they've been doing what they call their FELV adoption program for many years. And in our study, these are all the locations that sent FELV positive cats to Austin for adoption. And at the, in a recent paper that we just did of 800 cats that, were, that came in over a two year period, this is where they all came from. And you can see this was great for our study, but it's really not a sustainable idea that all of the FELV positive cats in the states are gonna come to Austin to get adopted. So the great thing is they have proof of principle, they've developed all of the handouts and protocols, and now we're encouraging everyone to develop their own programs. It's a study that we um, just submitted for publication of 800 cats that went to the FELV adoption program. They retest cats on intake, and 20% of the cats were not uh, proven to be infected at intake. So there's an issue with, you know, making, don't make life or death decisions based on a single test because it might not be correct. And then of the rest of the cats that were in the adoption program, 80% got adopted out and 17% died or were euthanized. And so that is a lot less than the traditional euthanasia rate of 100%. This was just such encouraging news about how well these cats could do. And then even, even more exciting was they did an adoption satisfaction survey and they went back to these people that adopted the FELV positive cats and asked questions like, would you do it again? Are you, do you have any regrets? you know, what, what was your satisfaction level? And we found that uh, the vast majority of people who adopted these cats had the experience that they expected. They were very proud of having adopt, adopted a cat and they would do it again. And so, and so that's the Austin program. These other programs are popping up. This is one at Treehouse Humane Society in Chicago. And I just, I put this up there because I love their signage. It's so positive. This is how most programs start is there's some cat or foster parent that there's positive cats and it was protocol to euthanize them in the past. And then there's a cat everyone fell in love with. So they pilot an adoption program and they find out it's not so scary after all. And then it just takes off. And that's exactly what happened. Their PR department made this sign for a litter of positive kittens that was super cute. In fact, this is them. And that they adopted those kittens out right away. And that was the beginning of the treehouse adoption program. And they have these, this excellent fact sheet, again, making sure people are really well educated. And this went so well, they had built a, they got a new shelter and they had built a cat cafe in it and they turned it into an FELV cat cafe. So the only cats in the cat cafe are the F, FELV positive cats. So it's what a great way to showcase cats that maybe need a little bit more marketing. 
And they're not the only ones to do it. This is, has anyone been to this Nico Cat Cafe in Seattle? You sent a cat there. I just, they have the best website. And it's not just a cat cafe, but it's a wine bar too. And um, their whole organization is just about running this cat cafe uh, for FELV positive cats. And as you would expect for Seattle, it's very hipster, cool, nice. And you should visit their website. And this is just um, what it looks like. And I look at those tables. Desperately want one of those tables. <laughs> And who wouldn't want to hang out there? So, so this is um, a quote from Dr. Sheila Segerson, who's the scientific director at Maddie's Fund and was the one that really envisioned the study that we're doing and has led to all of these amazing results. And it is so true. This is one of the Felvies from Austin Pets Alive, is that people are adopting these cats, loving them, and not regretting it. And I do have to thank uh, all of the people who made this possible. This is an enormous research team, funding from Maddie's Fund, uh, support from IDEX Pets Alive, the amazing, uh, from IDEX, and then the amazing team of uh, folks at Austin Pets Alive that actually handled the cats and collected a lot of blood for us and the Wind Feline Foundation. So with that, I think um, we have some time for questions. Um, so I, I work at a cat sanctuary. We do group housing, and right now we are retesting on intake and then at 30 days. Um, I guess I was wondering, is that what you would recommend? So the 30-day testing is to catch those cats that might have been just recently infected that you miss on the first screening. And so the chances in a whole cat's lifetime that you're going to, like, pick it up in that few weeks just after it got infected are pretty remote. So we don't generally recommend that with the exception that like if they came in with an abscess, like, oh, you got bit by another cat that was aggressive, um, or maybe a hoarding case where they were mixing up cats and so you know that there's more ongoing um, exposure. But otherwise, I would say I probably would not. And, and your, your data should inform that. Like, are you getting a lot of positive or more than ever getting a positive at 30 days. We, we, we had one. Yeah, so still. one is probably not worth it to design a whole except, uh, program around the exceptional case. Um, what I would say, though, is hopefully your cats don't stay 30 days. Like, we're all about now reducing length of stay, getting cats like in and out of the shelter as soon as possible so you can save more cats. Thank you. Yeah. We live in North Carolina and BFE, North Carolina, if any of you know where BFE is. Mm -hmm. And uh, the vets around there all euthanize. I feel they yeah. euthanize immediately. So, I mean, they, they will tell people to euthanize. How do we, you know? Yeah, so that's certainly a problem. And I would say that um, general practitioners are kind of, are slower to get the new news than shelters are and, and some others are. And so that's on us to really roll that out. That's why we have new guidelines and we're doing a lot of speaking at conferences. And so I think um, it would be a great idea to bring this, these documents around, set up an appointment to meet. Um, we've got webinars on this that they can do, but really like get out there and have some face-to-face -face conversations to bring everybody up. It's kind of hard to have that productive conversation about a cat that's tested positive because then everybody's reactive and defensive. So going out and saying, hey, it's new, brand new information from the cat vets, and this is uh, what we're doing now. But also on Sunday, when Monica and I have a session together, we're going to talk about um, working better, more productively with veterinarians. Hi, we have a rescue in Wichita Falls, and we pulled a cat from our local uh, shelter, uh, our city shelter, and it ended up having FIP. And so there's some new developments with that. And actually one of our, our foster who has her actually has done uh, the medication. And now there's like an 84 day period. And actually she's responding really well to that. So, so what's your so opinion? Really interesting about, you know, FIP has been the most horrific disease, kills young cats, untreatable, really even hard to diagnose, um, just total frustration. And UC Davis, uh, Dr. Peterson, tripped across an antiviral drug that really seems to be promising in treating FIP. And so people, um, so there's no drug approved anywhere in the world, so it's not approved, it was just experimental. And, but there was a two day conference where they released this information, it's been published, and so people now are desperate and they're acquiring the drug. There's two sources you can get it from now. One is a 
a company called Mutian in the US. You can actually, they've, they've instead of tried to go through FDA, they're just calling it a supplement, which isn't regulated at all. And so you can just go on the website and buy their drug and it will cost anywhere from 3,000 to 10,000, depending on the size of the cap. So pretty big. The other way you can get it is to take your chances on the Chinese black market where they are duplicating these drugs and that is where most of the people were getting their drugs. And so it's a little bit cheaper and we were seeing really good um, responses for a lot of cats. If you are interested in this, it's a fascinating story. Facebook group called FIP Warriors. It's got 15,000 people on it now that are treating their cats and the admins are really good at talking people through it and um, sharing drugs around. These drugs are hard to get. So it was weird enough as it was, now it has gotten super weird because this drug looks like it probably works against the Chinese coronavirus. And so there is, so now we have a pandemic um, of coronavirus that is killing people with a drug probably that works. So it's being fast tracked, evaluated for that, which means I can't see why these companies would sell it to cat owners when they could you know, distribute it to people dying in China. And there's already been one well-documented case of a, sh a whole shipment of the Chinese drug, which is being shipped to the U.S. illegally for these cat people, um, of it being adulterated, or it was just fake. It didn't have any of the drug in it. Cats that were being treated relapsed, and some cats died because it probably had toxic stuff in it too. And so when it was analyzed, there was no drug. And the explanation was their shipper swapped it out, and that would be legit like believable because you could probably sell it on the Chinese black market for a lot more than you could sell it to cat people. Or they just weren't, you know, nobody's regulating this and looking at the manufacturing. So I, I think that's an incredibly fascinating story. It is like the beginning of the AIDS epidemic when AZT became available, but it wasn't approved. And so these patients who were going to die without it found ways to get it illegally and, and established buying clubs. And that happened a lot faster than the regulatory approval process could. And we're seeing the same thing with coronavirus. Well, she's responding really well. Yeah, and is Natasha here? So Natasha um, it was running the FELV, the FELV program at Austin Pets Alive. And so she's got, um, FIP is the most common reason they were euthanizing cats in their FELV program. So she's tracking like five cats that have FELV and they're all responding really well. Too. So we don't know if their long-term outcome will be as good, but it's it's really encouraging. Um, I'm amazed that both of our we have two local vets that work with our rescue, and they're doing um, some B12 shots or mm -hmm. something like that, and they're really interested to see how the results are. And the medication she got is guaranteed that if it doesn't work and she gets sick again, they'll provide. The medication. Yeah, that's the median. It's more expensive, but it comes with that guarantee. But I also like they presumably will also divert their drug soon to human treatment, I'm guessing. Any other questions? Yes. Um, how did you choose your, your feline um, leukemia test? You were saying not to use the Abaxis? Um, yeah, so good question. How, how has that been validated? And what we did was we, we took 300 samples, half of which um, we had confirmed for FELV by other methods and then half of which were negative, and we blinded them all, so we numbered them with codes, and then we just lined up all the tests, four different tests, and tested them against their known outcome, and then, then we could tell which ones performed the best. So the SNAP was the best, the WITNESS was a close second, and Abaxis was like flipping a coin. And we've, I've had that problem too with Abaxis tests for um, uh, Parvo, We've, we have investigated like outbreaks of parvo, and when we got into it and started sorting it out, it wasn't an outbreak of parvo, it was a false positive with their parvo test. And one thing I should say, that's kind of, you reminded me, is Abaxis tests have been purchased by Zoetis, which also has the witness test, so now they are selling both, and they're, so I don't know which way they're gonna go, but um, we really, SNAP test, the IDEX test. Probably the witness test, I, I think, is probably good as well. Um, it's just those, I just ha don't have confidence based on our field experience and that one study we did on FVLV with the Abaxis tests. Hi, I have a yes. question. Um, you didn't mention anything about batch testing kittens um, with feral 
litters that we bring in or that come in pretty early in their life, a lot of times we just test one. Um, your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's just a really risky procedure to just test one cat in a litter because you can have two out of four kittens be infected. And so randomly, if you just pick one and assume that all of the, the kittens have 100% the same result, you, it's just not how it is. And similarly, we've had cases where the mom tests negative, but then later we test some kittens and they're positive or vice versa, mom's positive and the kittens are, are negative. So you, it's really kind of inappropriate probably to test one cat and extrapolate it to other cats. I've seen people do the similar thing with uh, TNR colonies too, where they'll test you know, half a dozen cats out of um, uh, the 50 or whatever that's in a colony. And it's even in TNR cats, the prevalence is so low that you can't really reliably sample a few and extrapolate it to the rest of the colony. So it's really much better to not test at all or test one test per cat. There's some folks in the back there that have been waiting. You said that um, the FELV vaccination recommend doing that unless they're um, several housed together? What, what constitutes? So FELV vaccination, there's a couple places I would use that. One is, and I used to do internal medicine, and we would diagnose like an infect, FELV infected cat in a household. And I would say, okay, now you got to segregate your household. You know, you put a screen door in the hallway and you got two populations. And I had like zero clients that would comply with that because that's, you know, ridiculous advice. And so that is a group we would recommend vaccinating all of the uninfected cats. If a client is gonna keep their positive cat in that household. Um, I would not recommend if they have a negative household to intentionally go out and get a positive cat. And I think most people avoid that, but sometimes they just end up with one accidentally. Um, and then the, for the FELV vaccine to work, you actually have to give both vaccines. It's not one that works after one vaccine like a Panluke vaccine does. And so you, you, they have to be planned to be in your shelter a reasonable amount of time before they're gonna be immune, so probably like a month. And so what I would recommend is if you have a cat sanctuary, the lot of cats that are commingling, I actually recommend vaccinating those cats against FELV because that's where suddenly these regressive cats can start to be a threat. And we see that when we go in and do big cat hoarding cases. And we've had sanctuaries of 700 cats and they tested them all on intake, but you know their, change, their status changes over time, especially if they're stressed. And so if you miss them in a sanctuary, the stakes are a little higher. Well, we, we stopped FIV testing, and we took that money, and we're using it to vaccinate. But these are all cats who are getting adopted. So is that you would not recommend that? I, w I wouldn't. I would say that there's probably... Like there's nothing wrong with it, you won't hurt the cats and, and maybe you won't help a few cats, but you probably have other top priorities that you could use that money to help other cats more, help more cats. Congratulations on your study, it's great. Um, it looked like based on your cats that you followed for three years that the majority were that were positive were progressive. Are you finding that more progressive and are you seeing any patterns with the progressive cats? Like for example, are they mostly adults that are progressive or any trends? Yeah, good question. So we had um, over half of the cats that were of the 130 cats in our study fell into that progressive camp. And and so it's tempting to go, oh, most cats that become infected are progressive. However, if you think about how our cats came into our possession for this study, they're screened at some other shelter and they're positive, so they get sent to Austin and then that's our study pool. So it's not a random sample of cats. And the thing is for those cats that are abortive, so say they become infected and then they fight off the virus, that happens in just a few weeks. So that just your chances if you test a cat at some random point in its life, you're gonna miss that. And you will never have known that that cat ever was infected. So that's gonna underestimate the number of cats that have abortive infections. And similarly for the cats with regressive, because sometimes their levels fall below the levels of detection, that we may test those cats at times and they'll be negative. And those cats are not sent to Austin, right? Because they, they had a negative test at intake. So it isn't entire, it really isn't known like if you just um, become infected with FELV, what proportion abort, what proportion are regressive and what proportion are progressive. But we're gonna, it's gonna be easier to diagnose the progressive ones, so they're gonna look overrepresented, if that makes sense. Thank you, yeah, it does. Hi, um, 
nine cats came into an open admission shelter, rescues pulled, three out of the nine tested positive. So the rescues were gonna hold on to the ones that are negative and we're gonna retest in 60 days. But here's my question, if they test negative again and talking with the owner, they were allowed, they weren't separated. Mm -hmm. So they were, they were definitely exposed. If they come back negative again, or do you maybe do a PCR, what would your advice be? Um, so I think that that's a very diligent approach to detect the vast majority of cats that were gonna be infected. If you wanted to go all out, you could do the PCR um, one and just like be super diligent about it. I'm not exactly sure what the cost of that is. They're hi highly subsidizing that test, so it's probably in the $50 range, so really not like, way out of range for something that you could do three cats or six cats, however many it right. would be. Um, so I think you could go either way, just retest the cats with whatever you're using in house and if they're negative, declare that they're negative. I do think it's kind of the responsible thing to disclose to adopters that they came from this positive environment, we've tested twice, we think they're negative. And similarly, if you ever had a positive test in the past and then they tested negative later, I would still disclose that there was a positive test in the past so that people can make fully informed decisions. I will tell you, like, another reason I'm, I've kind of let go of needing to be 100% certain is a uh, experience I had which will shake your confidence overall. So I had a, a mother cat and her eight, four eight-week-old kittens. And I tested all of them separately with a snap test. The kittens were all negative and the mother cat had a weak positive but the negative control didn't work. So there's funky tests. And so then I, I tested them all with a symbiotics tests and they were all negative. So I separated mom from the kittens and every month I tested them all with a snap test, a symbiotics test and uh, IFA at that time. And the kittens were always negative and the mom just would only have this occasional weird test on a snap test, but be negative on everything else. So I did that four times. So now the kittens are six months of age. I adopted them to four separate houses, and we adopted mom as a single cat because um, we didn't know what she really was. So at six months later, so now the kittens are a year old, I get a call that one of the kittens is dying. Uh, she's FELV positive, and she's got anemia, fatal anemia. So I brought in the other three kittens that had all gone to separate houses and tested them, and they were all positive. Mm. So I'm certain those kittens were infected the whole time I had them, but they were acting regressive. And for some reason, that virus liberated itself later and caused disease. So, like, it just shows, I, I was working in a research lab. I could do all of this testing that was absurd for people to do in the real world. And still, I couldn't be perfect with it. So just understand that you can get really close to 100% certain, but you can't get all the way there. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you.